witam już na 17 Gdańskich Wykładach Solidarności. Cyklu, który jest organizowany przez Europejskie Centrum Solidarności razem z Uniwersytetem Gdańskim. Cieszę się bardzo z dzisiejszego spotkania, ponieważ wydaje mi się, że dzisiaj możemy powiedzieć, że po kilku latach udało nam się stworzyć już pewną tradycję spotkań. Spotkań z wybitnymi przedstawicielami nauk społecznych z Polski i ze świata. Z Polski gościliśmy tak wybitnych socjologów jak Pawła Śpiewaka, Ireneusza Krzemińskiego, Jadwigę Staniszki z, ze świata socjologii, no, Nestora francuskiej nowoczesnej socjologii, Alana Turena, Jeffreya Goldfarba, także polskich naukowców, którzy tworzą za granicą, jak Sławomira Magale z Rotterdamu. No i bardzo się cieszę, że udało nam się, to mogę powiedzieć, po bardzo długim czasie korespondowania, wymiany listów i, i namawiania, żeby jednak znalazł czas dla nas. Bardzo się cieszę, że jesteśmy dzisiaj gospodarzami wykładu jednego, no mogę to spokojnie powiedzieć, z najwybitniejszych socjologów, myślicieli, intelektualistów tego początku wieku. Bardzo serdecznie witam w Gdańsku pana profesora Ulrysia Beka. Witam pana bardzo serdecznie. Powiem szczerze, że zapraszając do Gdańska nie zauważyliśmy małego szczegółu. Profesor Beck urodził się w 40 czwartym roku w Słupsku, także można powiedzieć, że jest stąd, z Pomorza i wyjątkowo się ucieszyłem, jak usłyszałem wczoraj, że, że jest pierwszy raz w Gdańsku. I wydaje mi się, po wczorajszych już spotkaniach nie będzie to ostatnia wizyta, a początek dłuższej przyjaźni z panem profesorem Bekiem. Wydaje mi się, że na tej sali nie muszę zbyt głęboko przedstawiać dzieło pana profesora Beka. Jest, należy do tych socjologów europejskich, którzy byli są systematycznie tłumaczeni na język polski. Ostatnio, w tych dniach właśnie można powiedzieć, ukazały się dwie książki, które pokazują też wachlarz zainteresowań i, i, i wszechstronność pana profesora Beka. Polecam ich lekturę. To jest wydany przez PWN esej Niemiecka Europa. To jest z jednej strony analiza dynamiki integracji europejskiej, kryzysu Europy ostatnich lat oraz esej na temat, w jaki sposób można opanować ten kryzys, na temat dosyć paradoksalnej sytuacji, nowej mocarstwowej roli Niemiec, niespodziewanej. Książka, która w dużej mierze też jest analizą tej głębokiej transformacji, tych głębokich przemian, który przechodzi świat. To jest książka, która jest, można powiedzieć, esejem politycznym, ale w której odnajdziecie Państwo i socjologa Ulrysia Beka, i Europejczyka, i wielkiego intelektualistę. Inna książka, której jeszcze nie czytałem, ale po rozmowach jestem przekonany, że też wielu tutaj Państwa na sali zainteresuje, to jest Świeżo wydana monografia Miłość na odległość. Modele życia w epoce globalnej. Współautorką tej książki jest żona pana Becka, Elisabeth Beck Gernsheim. Jest to nieco inne spojrzenie na przemiany, które nas wszystkich dotyczą. Perspektywa naszych relacji prywatnych na skutek migracji, na skutek też kosmopolityzacji dzisiaj związki czy partnerskie, czy małżeńskie nie są ograniczone do codziennego wspólnego życia. Ma to oczywiście też wpływ nie tylko na jednostki, ale też na społeczeństwo. Także zachęcam, wymieniam tylko te dwie lektury, które pokazują wrażliwość naszego gościa. Szanowni Państwo, zapraszam na wykład pana profesora Beka. Jeszcze raz bardzo serdecznie dziękuję, że przyjął Pan nasze zaproszenie i zapraszam do ponownego spotkania tutaj w Gdańsku. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation, for your present, for your attention. 
Um, I think for a sociologist or maybe an intellectual or maybe just a normal person uh, to come to this part of, of Europe uh, is a very important experience. I actually learned yesterday a lot about Dansk and, and this crazy history of, of the city and the place. Maybe an interesting European uh, city as well. And I even uh, changed my notes this morning uh, in order to get some of the learning, uh, 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 in order to take consequences of this learning process I had yesterday. Uh, well, we live in times in which our most sensitive and most important means of communication and acting, our language, is failing to capture, understand, and explain the reality we are living in. This is actually one of my main concerns, which follows through all the many publications I um, had so far. It is about overcoming, as I uh, name it, overcoming the zombie categories and the zombie institutions which dominate our head, dominate politics, and are not really related to the reality we are, ex we are experiencing. And this is exactly the problem I want to talk to you about today. I start with the distinction um, in relation to social theory. I think at the beginning of the 21st century, we have to make a clear distinction between social theories, which on the one hand concentrate on the reproduction of social and political order, and on the other hand, on the transformation of the social and political order. This distinction is very fundamental, but it needs all kinds of explanations. Let me first of all point to the big events. Uh, you all will remember um, during the last, let's say, 50 years or so, the breakdown of the communist system and uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, Chernobyl, 9-11 um, as a symbol for transnational terrorism, climate change as something which is ongoing and hard to grasp and hard to find political solutions, the financial crisis, Fukushima, the euro crisis, all of those big issues, they have, I, at least three important features in common. First, because they really occurred, they were inconceivable. They were not just, we, we didn't just expect them, they were not just on the landscape of our imagination. This means that actually the way we look at the world, the way we conceptualize the world, doesn't contain those kinds of events, which, and this is a second uh, feature, uh, are global in their, in their essence. And this is what makes them occur and the consequences of it. They are globally in the, in the essential sense of the word. And third, to just uh, give you another aspect of these events, they are, have a huge political mobilizing force. They really changed the political landscape in many directions, all over the world at once. Maybe it's, it's uh, the change is forgotten after a time, but all those three features they have in common, inconceivable, global, 
and uh, mobilizing force which change actually th the political landscape and which demonstrates that we are actually not at the end of politics as often people and social scientists seem to argue, but at the beginning of a new kind of politics which we have a hard time to analyze, conceptualize, define uh, and so on. You know, and this is what I learned yesterday actually, transformation has a special meaning in this context. It's not your idea of transformation. It's a completely different form of transformation. The transformation you have experienced is from a communist system to a capitalist system, to make a long story very short. It did have a specific uh, point where it starts and it had a strict goal where it go to. It, it just was implemented in a specific way. It was an ideology. Or it, 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 it did have uh, specific norms which had to be realized. It's actually a process of technocratic implementation of specific conditions of capital, capitalistic market, uh, democracy, and all those institutions which were actually fixed at the point uh, when you accepted them and did uh, up to today try to implement them. Those transitions I'm talking about are not intentional. Nobody wants this to happen. They are not part of the public discussion. They don't have any ideology. They are often not seen. They are unintended, unwanted consequences of the success of modernization. The successes of modernization produce consequences which undermine our institutions. It's not even the crisis in the normal sense, which we always had in mind. It is just the success, the success of your kind of transformation, the success of ongoing modernization creates all kinds of global problems, like I was talking about, which undermine again the institutions of what I call first modernity. If you look at this first understanding and definition of transformation of social and political order, you find out that most of the social scientists and theorists we are talking about do not really take these issues seriously. In fact, all the big names uh, are more in the category of reproduction of social and political order. Think, for example, um, Pierre Bourdieu, a wonderful, very sophisticated uh, sociology international, just with lots of brilliant books and articles, but he is even proud demonstrating that class society is still existent and is the main issue of our time. It's a reproduction of class society, even if it's changing to some extent, but at the end we are living again in a nationalized class society. Or take, of course, Talcott Parsons, who is thinking about the reproduction of the national society. Or think about Michel Foucault, again, a wonderful, um, sophisticated theory, but at the end his clue is whatever happens, power is being reproduced. Power is actually the main issue, and you can do whatever you want to do, it is a reproduction of power. And to some, no, a good example again is um, uh, Niklas Luhmann, who is actually concentrating on the Yes, on the reproduction of systems, autopoetic systems, as he calls them. In, in this perspective, actually, in the background, you have a uh, you have a vision of a stability uh, of something of reproduction of order, which might be um, uh, adequate for a relatively short period of time after the Second World War. Uh, till the beginning of the 21st century maybe, but which doesn't grasp really this transformation we are now experiencing. The indicator that social theory doesn't really get the point of, of the transformation is a very small, tiny word, and this is the word post. 
everything is post-Nordi. Post-modernity, post-politics, post-democracy, post-feminism, post, post, post. Post is, I would say, maybe the key word for our time, but at the same time, it demonstrates that we don't know the situation we are living in. Because post says only what is not the case, but it doesn't say what is the case. Post is actually uh, a symbol or an indicator for intellectual laziness. We don't, we don't really take the question seriously what kind of reality is coming up. We are satisfied with saying post. This is um, exactly where the theory of reflexive modernization comes in. It's not post-modernity, it's reflexive modernization. Because this is what I said at the beginning, the idea is, the basic theoretical idea is that by radicalizing, universalizing, globalizing modernity, the Western way of modernity, we are producing consequences uh, unwanted, unseen consequences which undermine the institutions, the nation-state institutions, but at the same time they undermine also uh, the frame of references in which politics and social sciences is organized. So it's actually those side effects again, the revolutionary side effects, which make this transformation happening and which makes it so difficult to grasp it again in the conventional theory. Reflexive modernization has, in my view, in my theory, many others do accept the theory also, three dynamics. The first dynamic is with society or world with society. The second is individualization. And the third is cosmopolitization. I'm going to explain those dynamics. I, I cannot concentrate so much on, I will not concentrate so much on, on all the specific ideas, but just to give you some idea. All three dynamics follow the same logic. They are product of the radicalization of modernity, producing side effects, which undermine the nation-state uh, conventional model and our concepts and methodologies to re make research on those. Let me start with risk society and world risk society. Um, I, at the beginning, I said I'm actually struggling to invent a new language to understand the dynamics uh, which we are living in, transformative dynamics which we are living in. The term with society is exactly a term which I invented in order to make something visible. And there's a very interesting point. Lots of misunderstandings come up. You have to know that in German it, it, it is Risikogesellschaft. Risikogesellschaft is one word. And I invented this word in order to demonstrate that we are living in a world which cannot be understood by risiko and cannot be understood by society. We are beyond risk and we are beyond society. Therefore, I invented the term risikogesellschaft. It is to make sure the old concept of risk doesn't work and the old concept of society doesn't work because the consequences of modernity just undermine those assumptions which we take for natural. In the English translation, it is risk society, which is two words. And if you just look at, at the literature, uh, a completely different understanding of those basic ideas come up because then you actually have the, have the, have the expectation or the, the image, the Im imagination, that it is about risk and society and it's risk in society. Uh, societies are more and more uh, talking, managing, self-produced risk. This is not my thesis. It's part of my thesis, but it's actually not uh, the main idea of my thesis. So the problem in creating new concepts 
is you have, at least this is the way I try to do it, you have to, you, to use old concepts in order to create a new understanding. And this is again a resource for misunderstanding. And those misunderstandings are pretty much part of, of uh, the translation into different languages as well. So I think there's a basic misunderstanding that risk society is actually a society which is concerned with risk. I'm telling the story that risk society is about a society which is producing uncontrollable un uncertainties, which undermine the, our idea of society and, and politics. Let me just uh, give a very short uh, historical background for risk and, and the, the different concepts and understanding which come up at this stage. Actually, what I'm talking now about is pretty much a, a social scientific consensus, even if the terms may be used differently uh, between, for example, uh, Giddens, uh, uh, even Habermas, Luhmann, myself and others, I think the understanding is similar. First of all, risk is a modern concept. Risk pre-proposes decision. It pre-proposes decision makers. Uh, this is a big distinction, so it, it comes up with modernity. It is not, and this is the first differentiation, it is not a threat by nature or by God. It's not a catastrophe in the sense of a natural catastrophe. And this is very important because already this distinction makes clear that um, if it is man-made uncertainty, if it is man-made risk, then responsibility and, and the political dimension of risk and risk society is getting very important. So the first distinction is between uh, natural catastrophes or whatever you want to call them, or threats, sometimes by God, sometimes by nature, and man-made uh, catastrophes on risk. Uh, how difficult this distinction is, you can already observe uh, in the discussion on climate change. Because uh, the man-madeness, the fact that climate change is man-made, is not visible. We have a hard time in, in seeing or making a difference between man-made catastrophes and natural catastrophes. They are both natural to us, to our senses. And only, and this is actually the fight about climate change, when it is man-made, then all the responsibility and political questions come up. So we have dangers and threat, not man-made. We have risk, and this is the invention, let's say, from uh, the 16th century, and especially in, in relation to industri industrialization, risks which make the man-made uncertainty of modernity controllable. It's a way to try to control the uncertainties we produce by modernity. And here the dialectic of risk and insurance comes up, all the differentiations of, of institutions we have and created in this respect. So risk is actually about the controllability, the characterability of uncertainty which is produced uh, by modernizers, by modernizing process, and, and which then is uh, distributed unequally over uh, special groups. And now we are in the stage of global risks. And you have to be careful again, it's not risk, it is, it is exactly the phase where manufactured uncertainties um, became globally, globally perceived and therefore developed their own, uh, their own political dynamics. Like Hiroshima, maybe this was one of the first examples, uh, Chernobyl, climate change, financial risks, all those which we are talking about already. And they all are, this is again important, uh, consequences of the success of modernization because uh, we are so fantastic uh, in, in, for example, in physics, uh, we produce atomic bombs and atomic energy and are not able to control them. 
and so on. You can always, it's the success of, of modernity and maybe not. It's even if, if there's no unemployment, if it is actually, if the, if the economy is working, if there's innovation in a, in a normal sense, then often those kind of challenges are being produced. And this is different than the idea of, of uh, crisis, which we normally have in, in all the theories. And it's, it's not about, or, or it is about rationality, but in a different sense, in the sense that rationality, like Max Weber uh, talked about, rationality is being threatened. If you look at this kind of global risks, I would like to point out two features. The first feature is we clearly have to make a distinction between risk and catastrophe. Risk is not catastrophe. Risk is the anticipation of catastrophe in order to make, to make it happen, to, to, to prepare oneself to prevent the catastrophe from happening. Risk is the anticipation of catastrophe in order to prevent it from happening. And this makes it so interesting for the social sciences because it's a, it's a kind of staging of risk. You need all kind of media or kind of mobilization in order to make those kinds of risk visible and believable, which then do have an important um, um, uh, political Im implication. So it's actually um, the logic, uh, the political logic of um, self-destroying prophecy, which is um, in the background of, of global risk issues. They are constructed in order to make those um, events not happen. Many people confuse in this sense risk society with catastrophe society. An example of the latter would be something like a titanic society. Such a society is dominated by the motto too late, by fate doom, the panic of desperation. Therefore, it is so important to distinguish risk from catastrophe analytic, analytically and politically because the perceptions of global risks are a huge mobilizing force and creating even maybe a global public on issues. And in this sense, uh, there's a certain affinity between um, Ernst Bloch's theory of hope and, and with society. And the second feature of, of global risk, uh, there is a relationship between global risk and cosmopolitanism. Because global risks create some kind of a new shared fate. Shared fate uh, beyond borders. In order to react to those problems, you have to cooperate. And there comes something like a cosmopolitan imperative, uh, cooperate or fail. You can see this very, very good in, in, in the Euro European crisis now, because actually uh, this logic comes up always. Uh, the more the politicians see that actually Europe could fail, could break together, that there could be a catastrophe, suddenly they start uh, to uh, maybe even invent uh, new terms or uh, reinvent elements of a, of a new institutional design for Europe. So uh, the outcome of these transformative dynamic of global risks is open. It's ongoing and open. Can be very uh, different scenarios. I would just shortly distinguish between a Hegelian scenario and a Carl Schmitt scenario. The Hegelian version, in the Hegelian version, national egoism go on climbing to provide solutions to the crisis until the front wheels of the carriage 
called Europe are actually hanging over the cliff edge. And in that situation, the glimpse of an abscess may well bring some new salvatory forces into action. So here comes this uh, cosmopolitan imperative cooperate or fail. And it's the background for this is the Hegelian logic of the irony uh, of reason, Ironie der, der Vernunft, which actually has a historical opportunity right now in, in Europe, and you can even watch that this is happening. On the other side, the Carl Schmitt scenario um, actually is a political game which is played with the anticipation of catastrophe. And this is used for political purposes, and we invent even the national uh, borders, and so on and so on. You can see this at the same time in Europe. Often, you can, often the same person is in one aspect uh, Hegel, and in the other aspect Carl Schmitt. You can't even separate those two, um, definitely. Um, but Schmitt is historically getting wrong. I make a very short and an important statement, because when you look at those global threats, at those global problems, the distinction between friend and foe doesn't work, or it doesn't work in the same way. Because in order to solve problems, to f solve those existential problems for every nation and every individual, you have to cooperate, and you even have to bridge friend-foe distinctions. This is a new log logic which comes up. Let me very shortly say a few remarks to the second dynamics, individualization. Individualization is not about individualism, is not about emancipation, egoism, me society, but it's about institutionalized individualization. It's again, uh, it's not the ideology, it's a sociological concept which is related to institutions. All uh, the basic rights, for example, civil rights, political rights, social rights, are addressed to the individual, not addressed to, to uh, class or families or social groupings. This was a huge discussion and conflict in Europe in the 19th century, but the individual interpretation is actually uh, the one which uh, uh, was implemented all over. So um, we have an institutionalized process of producing uh, a way of organizing your own life individually. And this is even becoming more important in, in the gender relations because man and woman are supposed to be equal, are supposed to have both their own uh, career or work or basis for economic basis for their own living. And this means there are contradictory uh, roles and contradictory dynamics which always have to negotiate and find some solution. There's no, no uh, uh, solution for all those uh, institu institutional problems. Part of the project I'm making is, for example, comparing Europe individualization with Asian individualization, with China, Japan, and South Korea. And it's very interesting that, in fact, those countries have a very strong process of individualization. Our, our image of a collective China with collective identities is wrong, because this kind of individualization process is very important under the surface, but it does have a completely different meaning. It doesn't have this institutional background of, of rights, of fundamental rights. It's more related to the global economy, to market economy, but at the same time, it's again connected with the internet and, the, and, and possible uh, publics which are being created. So it's, uh, on the one hand, uh, the communist system needs to open up in order to make this individualization happen because it's part of, of the economic rationality. But on the other hand, they want to control it. And there are lots of contradiction between those two developments. And you never know how stable, actually, those kinds of, of uh, uh, political systems really are. Now I come to the next um, 
step cosmopolitization. I would like to distinguish four stages in the discussion on globalization. The first stage is denial, saying there isn't actually anything important about globalization. Uh, lots of the social sciences are often in already or still in, in, in this category, in Germany too. Uh, the second is interconnectedness. I think if you think about um, globalization um, and if you want to find out what kind of empirical stuff there is, then the term interconnectedness is the most important term. This is the way it is empirically um, uh, studied and verified in and, and all the different dimensions of it, uh, uh, for example, by um, uh, David Held and his group on, on global transformation, a very big book in, uh, at the end of the, in the 90s, but many other um, uh, publications as well. So interconnectedness, is, interconnectedness means uh, beyond borders, interconnectedness as a global phenomenon in culture, in political, in, in economy, in, and so on and so on. If you think, try to find out what interconnected it means in sociological terms, then cosmopolitization comes in. Because interconnectedness means that the other, maybe the global other, the distant other, is excluded and included at the same time. Interconnected means suddenly they are made decisions someplace in the world or some uh, kind of, of consequences and work which directly uh, intervene, interfere and, and define your own existence, like the experiences in global risks uh, or maybe in, in love affairs and in, in family issues, all the line down. So cosmopolitization is actually the inclusion of the excluded distant other. So some kinds often of an enforced inclusiveness. People don't like to be dependent on the other and they want to get rid of it. They even build new walls. They enforce new borders. But still the other cannot be excluded in many ways anymore. Take a very simple example, the nannies. I think it will be maybe over here in, in Poland the same if two couples are, uh, have a problem how to, uh, how to solve parenthood and, and the issues of parenthood and household. They engage some person from a, from a different nationality, uh, a woman who is maybe the mummy for their own children and it's the same uh, a mummy for her own children some other place. And this happens with Polish people in Germany. I don't know if this happens with Polish family, again, from some other country. And it's not something which happens individually. It is one of the great migration flows and flows of our, of our century. Actually, this is what migration means. It's not so much men migration anymore, it's women migration and very much related to household work and other caretaking. So here you have a setting in which on the one hand we look at a national household, but in order to understand what's happening in the national household, you have to make connection to some other places uh, in the world. And if you don't do this, you really don't understand what's going on in your own national context. This is actually part of, of distant love uh, in many relations, but it makes clear that actually this cosmopolitization happens in many, dyna many dynamics in an, on an everyday level which we um, normally uh, don't recognize them if you look at them from a national point of view. And here I think it's very important, it comes up with cosmopolitization, comes up a critique of methodological nationalism critique of methodological nationalism. The social sciences, sociology, uh, often politics and international relations as well, are still prisoners of the nation state. They think in national categories, they do their empirical research in national 
categories, even if they, they produce their data in national categories, even if they compare different countries, they do it in national categories. They are not really open to the new interconnectedness, to the new uh, mixture of all kinds of social and political realities, which is part actually of the, of the cosmopolitization process. I'm, um, this year I started a project, a huge project, to overcome methodological nationalism and to create and practice what I call methodological cosmopolitanism, which means that we have to have different units of research, um, maybe global families, for example, or maybe cities or whatsoever, have different kinds of comparison, have, have to have different kinds of data production, and so on and so on. What does uh, cosmopolitization mean? We do not live in an age of cosmopolitanism, but in an age of cosmopolitization. The concept of cosmopolitanism is very rich and very loaded. It goes back to a Greek philosophy where it has been invented in the, in the European context. It has a great history during uh, 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 the Enlightenment period. Uh, Immanuel Kant uh, and many others uh, were really the thinkers of cosmopolitanism, but in a special way of cosmopolitanism, uh, namely in a universalistic way. The universalism and cosmopolitanism did have the same meaning for them. So it's a very rich and interesting uh, tradition. Uh, and we are again now in a situation, what I was talking about at the beginning, we have to choose concepts and names, knowns, uh, which op conventional knowns, which open us, which open up our view to the new realities. And I would say cosmopolitanism is a philosophical tradition, very rich, but did have, uh, still has important problems. It's idealistic. It seems to be an elite concept and so on. And so it's not really taken seriously by many people would say this is only something which is in related to our ethic but it's not related to our reality. And here comes the distinction to cosmopolitization in. Because cosmopolitization is about facts. It's about a, wor a world in which interconnectedness creates all kinds of enforced inclusiveness with the other. And it opens up a, a completely new perspective uh, actually on, on the empirical work we, world we live in. For example, suddenly we see that even our households are cosmopolitanized or we see how our cities are being changed in many ways because all kind of new people come in, they live here and there at the same time, the neighbors are changing dramatically, we don't understand the own world anymore which we are living in, and this happens and happens without anybody really wants it to happen, it's a side effect of, side effect of radicalized modernization, but suddenly we think even if we exclude, we realize that maybe even if you exclude in Poland every foreigner, uh, it, it doesn't really, of course it does matter, uh, but it doesn't really be effective because the other is in many ways part of our life anyway, in many, many ways, because of the internet, because of the um, um, dependencies in, in politics, in, in technology, and in all other issues as well. In order to illustrate what cosmopolitization mean, means, I would like to give you an example. And this is example, this example is about fresh kidneys. Fresh kidneys or the cosmopolitan human condition. Our world is marked by radical social inequalities. At the lower end of the global hierarchy are countless people who are trapped in a cycle of hunger, poverty, and debt, driven by sheer distress, many of them are willing to resort uh, to 
separate measures. They sell a kidney, part of their liver, a lung, or an eye, thereby given rise to a new kind of community of fate, very specific kind of community of fate, uh, which is actually uh, a fate ac across the center, the rich center of the world, and the excluded other uh, in different regions of the world. Um, and this is a very um, specific condition for those who need those organs and those who give those organs. Um, and this, again, is this possibility is opened up because of the progress of uh, uh, medical technology. Because we are better, becoming better, suddenly those consequences are part of our reality. Um, I read now some sentences to you because I think um, I'm very proud of those sentences. Um, it, it, it's difficult to be ironic uh, as a German professor, uh, therefore I mention this. Uh, Muslims kidneys pu purify Christian blood. White racist breathes with the help of black lungs. The blonde manager sees the world with the eyes of an African street child. A Catholic bishop survives thanks to the liver removed from a prostitute in a Brazilian favela. The bodies of the rich are being transformed into skillful patchworks, assemblers, those of the poor into one-eyed or one-kidneyed storehouses of spare parts. The piecemeal sale of their organs is thus becoming the life insurance of the poor. And this way, um, medicine, technology, is creating what you could call a biopolitical world citizen. A white male body, fit or fat, in Hong Kong or Manhattan or Berlin, fitted out with an Indian kidney or Muslim eye. This happens uh, actually without those two categories of man meet, without a dialogue, without being recognized to each other. It's a structural process which even connects your body uh, with across continents in a way that your own living depends on it with the excluded other. I think it's, it's the most radical illustration for the human conditions we are living in. We are not, it's not only interconnectedness, it's not only interdependence, it's a bodily uh, dependence on the other, which sometimes uh, even is happening without conscious dialogue, without uh, uh, noticing uh, what is really being done, but we are actually uh, involved in a shared fate. I think, therefore, this is, this, is, is, this is not a single case. This is not something which is uh, just uh, for a few people. This is an indicator of the human condition at the beginning of the 21st century. And it is about the simultaneous inclusion and exclusion of the distant other. They are being part of our body, but they still live in a different world. And this is beyond all the borders, all the institutions which try to separate us and uh, organize the political life. This, again, makes visible what I think is uh, what the transformation is about. Um, the transformation is about an unseen, unwanted, uh, let's even say revolution. Again, we are using maybe a conventional terms in a new way, uh, which changes our basic, of basic conditions of our life, of our institutions, of our self-understandings, of the uh, frame of reference in which we uh, try to analyze and try to research the reality we live in. 
And therefore, it's so important to make the distinction between uh, cosmopolitanism in a normative sense, which is actually the old and very important tradition up to today, and cosmopolitization as something which opens up the perspective for a new sociology in which all the basic concepts we are involved in, social inequality, class, family, state, nation, have to be redefined because they all uh, pre-propose a reality of either or. You are either this or that. You are either here or there. You are either national or international. But this kind of reality is both and, national and international. And we, you couldn't even use those words anymore because what is about uh, uh, the eye of, or the liver of a, of a different person uh, is not national and international and what's part of your, your own body, of your own existence. So this is um, about cosmopolitanism. And you can see a uh, cosmopolitization, and you can see the difference to cosmopolitanism. Co maybe I have to, I have to tell you um, uh, um, that the discussion on cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitization during the last 10 years is the most important, most uh, global discussions in the social and human, uh, social sciences and humanities all over the world. If you look at uh, sociology, geography, um, ethnographic studies, uh, geo, uh, geography, yes, uh, ge geography um, of course, political science, of course, philosophy, there's a new, huge uh, uh, literature on, on these kinds of cosmopolitanism. And to my own... Um, surprise and um, uh, actually stress and, and frustration, it's not really picked up in, in Central Europe. It's not, it, it's a British discussion, it's a Canadian discussion, it's a discussion in, in Canada, uh, not so much in, in the United States, at least not in the sociology of the United States, it's not so much picked up in, in, in um, France, uh, we Germans have difficulties too because we think of cosmopolitanism as the universal idea and of course uh, related to Kant and Habermas and many others. And we are not really open, opening up to this process of, of uh, cosmopolitization. So I think it's one of the most exciting uh, discussions in, in our fields of social sciences. Uh, well, let me at the end, shortly apply um, this theory, this theory of reflexive modernization and world with society uh, to the ongoing crisis of the European Union. As I said, in the situation uh, uh, we are now in, in Europe, the anticipation of catastrophe, the anticipation of the breakdown of the euro, the anticipation of the breakdown of the European Union even, is an enormous mobiliza mobilizing force. And dramatic changes in, in Europe are happening, which are not really noticed. Let me just point uh, at two of those changes in relation to uh, to the uh, power structure, power landscape in Europe. Um, because of the Euro crisis, we first have a split uh, between those countries who are in the Eurozone and those countries who are not in the Eurozone and only in the European Union. Because suddenly all issues of the future of Europe are being discussed and decided in the smaller group of the EU countries. And this is quite an amazing um, difference. Uh, for example, I know that, uh, I don't know how the public discussion goes here in Poland, but suddenly you fi feel yourself not being more a first class me member of, of, uh, uh, of Europe because you are only part of, of uh, the European Union or not really uh, part of, of uh, the Euro countries. 
and I think this is an embarrassment actually for us Europeans that suddenly there are first class and sec second class members and it happened because of these issues of, of anticipation of catastrophe. This, and uh, even, even more this is the case in relation to Great Britain. Uh, the British Prime Minister uh, still makes us believe, and uh, especially as people, believe that he has a veto power. But I'm not sure if there's still a veto power, because actually the basic issues are being decided in the Eurozone. And when you look at the decision making of the last years, they've all been without actually taking into responsibility and taking care about what uh, the British people think. So this is a basic change. The second split comes up uh, inside of the Euro countries. It is um, a split between those who give the money and those who need the money, debtor countries and receivers countries. And this is a huge split. I have to confess that all our thinking in social sciences is not ready to think about the inequality which comes from those distinctions. And it's really changing the power landscape of Europe totally, inside and outside of the countries. You cannot talk about inequality in Europe and maybe in the world without getting this distinction um, into the play, and which has important implications. And of course, because there's this split, suddenly Germany um, has a central position because of its economic power. Um, the British have quite a good uh, word for this. They say it is an accidental empire. Um, the German is an accidental empire. It was not, uh, there's no master plan, there's no military intervention, but somehow it happened under the conditions of the anticipation of catastrophe and the means to, to answer those, to those catastrophe. In my book on German Europe, I invented the term Merkiavelli. Merkiavelli, which is a combination uh, between Machiavelli and Merkel. Uh, trying to illustrate that it's quite a sophisticated way um, to react to, to this situation. Merkiavelli. When I talk about this in Germany, they think this is actually uh, a bad excuse, uh, a bad excuse, a bad excusation to Merkel. I talked to this about this in in Florence uh, at the headquarters, so to say of Machiavelli, and they said, this is a really bad thing you are talking, of, you are talking about Machiavelli, uh, because actually she isn't, doesn't have this art of politics. So actually, this is, those are basic changes in, in, in Europe, and which are threatening the basic values uh, of Europe, which were equality and changing of power, and so on and so on. Let me, um, at the end, give you um, a second, um, ask a second question. What act why actually Europe? Um, what is the purpose of the European Union? Besides getting money. Is there any purpose? Why Europe and why not the whole world? This is what many... Swedish youngsters say. Why not do it alone in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in the UK? I think there are five answers in this respect. I just want to name them uh, very shortly. The first is the European Union is about enemies becoming neighbors. This is in, from the point of view of European history, a miracle. It's a political miracle, which nobody really anticipated that this could happen 70 years ago, or at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, or whatsoever. How enemies become neighbors. Not neighbors who like each other, neighbors who quarrel, neighbors who don't know much about each other, neighbors who ignore each other, but neighbors and not enemies. 
and this is a huge success of the European Union. It should not be underestimated, especially not in the history of uh, Europe. And maybe there's even a model uh, for other uh, areas as well, for maybe, say, uh, Asian Union, which is still not happening because there's those background war memories which don't fit to uh, the power relations which are there now. Second, the second purpose of the European Union is that we can prevent countries from being lost in world politics. Without the European Union, actually, people are lost in, 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 in world politics. They're not, they're not increasing sovereignty, but decreasing sovereignty. A post-European Germany would be a lost Germany, completely different. A post-European Poland, post Poland would be quite different. A post-European Britain will be very different if they choose to, to have something like this. Actually, the European Union is what makes the European nations important from the outside perspective. The German power in Europe makes Germany globally important. And I think many of the Germans don't realize it. The next point is that we should not only think about another Europe, about a different Europe, but we should also think about another nations, different nations, different understandings of nations. As we can see in, in the crisis of, of uh, the Euro crisis, nation states are still important. They are not losing their importance. All the political issues are nation state issues. But they don't uh, function in relation to Europe. And uh, change of the self-understanding of the nation to open up to interconnections, seeing not dependence, but interdependence as the important issue. Being interdependent makes you more sovereign, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't make you lose sovereignty. This would be a change of, of the nation state and, and the national self-understanding. The paradox is that nationalism has become the enemy of the European nations. Nationalism doesn't really get the national interests because the national interest is actually combined with the European interest. You cannot, you, you cannot solve your own national problems if you're not connected. And this will be even more if you live in a, in a world where problems are getting global and you have to have find answers in, in cooperation with others and not in isolation uh, from each other. I think this is actually um, a, a good example for this, maybe the, the British uh, case. Uh, let's say, for example, that the Eurosceptics in Britain got their way and the UK quit the European Union altogether. You know, I, I'm partly Britain, you can't see it, but it's part of me as Britain because I'm actually living in Britain. I like them very much, so this is something which I really, um, be, I'm really concerned about. If this happens, if they really want to quit the European Union, would the British then have a clearer sense of identity? Would they have more sovereignty to run their own affairs? No, they would not. First of all, the Scots and the Welsh would almost certainly continue to look to the European Union anyway. Perhaps leading to the breakup of the UK. And Britain, or England then, would lose rather than gain sovereignty, if sovereignty means real power to influence their own affairs and the wider world. The simple reason is the European Union is better placed to advance national interest than the nations could possibly do, acting alone in issues of commerce and in all uh, issues which we are uh, confronted with many of the issues. The fourth point is that the European modernity, as I try to uh, demonstrate, 
um, is somehow a suicidal project. Uh, progress and, and suicide, uh, it's a new combination between, of course. Um, and let's take, for example, uh, uh, let's take a metaphor. Um, let's say that a car company created a car without any brakes and started to cause all, all kind of accidents because, well, all those problems. What would the company do? They asked the car back uh, to rework it. And I think this could be an important issue for the European Union of the future. Ask modernity back to reinvent it, to find new institutions uh, in relation to all the big problems which has been created by European modernity. This would be quite an adventure. It is necessary and it could motivate people and think that this is actually an important place to be in, important place to be involved. And last, fifth point, in the face of global risks like climate change, et cetera, and et cetera, the nations of the world seem paralyzed. Actually, now we see that the nations don't really take care of the problems which modernity has, has produced. Um, on the other hand, there are, um, let's say, cosmopolitan affinities between cities, between global cities. One of the most important differences uh, between nations and cities in the age of uh, global risk and cosmopolitization may be that nations dominantly renationalize and city dominantly could open up to those challenges. So cities could be, besides many other actors, become an important role. You know, there has been a historical backgrounds for cities. They actually were the places where democracy was invented. They were the places where many things happened before they were realized in, in other contexts. And now again, um, maybe cities and not cities by themselves, but connecting, pooling the sovereignty of cities where all those basic issues are being experienced and where people see climate change because it hurts them to some extent, and where people see the problem of migration and so on, something has to be done. And of course it could be that not the nation, but the city as an additional actor could get an important role in uh, finding answers and actors in this cosmopolitanized world. I think if you take those five elements together, they could create a narrative of, a, of another Europe, uh, combining those elements. And actually, we need a new narrative in order to make sense uh, what Europe is good for and to take seriously those um, questions. What is Europe actually for if it is not only for money, and economy, which is an important issue, but it's not all of the story. Um, let me finish with the last remark. We are living in an age of shared fate. And this shared fate becomes stronger if we ignore it, if we don't do anything about it, if we are not taking care of this. It becomes stronger, even if we don't want it to happen. Because of the transformation process we are involved in, we have no real perspective for this, because it isn't a transformation with a goal, with a perspective, with an ideology, with a meaning, it just comes by side effects, a revolution by side effects. This uh, again is a, maybe uh, a combination of words, of old words, which don't really fit to the new reality we are experiencing. Uh, even if we don't do anything, 
even if the course of politics doesn't change, this transformation happens. It's happening already. It's changing our foundations of living, of the institutions. Those institutions become delegitimized because they just don't function in relation to those new issues. We have functioning institutions maybe on the surface. Let's say we have, I don't know if we have it, but let's say for a moment they are functioning. But at the same time, they don't have any resources for those new global problems. The last time we experienced this was, I don't know if you have the same discussion here in Poland as we have it right now in Germany, on the digital risk being controlled by new kinds of digital control methods, you know, we have, maybe you have the same, uh, nobody, we have a constitutional right that nobody is supposed to open our letters, you know, and, and this is really functioning. We have all kind of actors finding out and looking that the letters are not being opened. But let's realize that this isn't the issue today. Email are not letters. And we don't have any institutions for these new uh, challenges. So on the one hand, there seems, the old institution seems to function, but they don't, they're dysfunctional in relation to the new transformative processes we are in. And the same is true to sociology and the social sciences. They seem to function, but they don't get the reality, uh, which is really transforming um, our everyday life, our institutions, our categories, and so on and so on. And therefore, I think we really have to redefine sociology. And what I mean is we have to come from methodological nationalism to methodological cosmopolitanism. This could be quite exciting. This could be exciting for sociologists and for the public as well. Because actually from the tradition of the social sciences, we were the ones who looked at, at change and transformations. And now we are getting conservative. We are just keeping the old categories and the old routines against those new ways of looking at the world. Therefore, I think we actually need a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift is always a good word. This is misused too from the national point of view, even if it's not a nationalistic. Uh, it's not a nationalistic social sciences. You're not nationalists, but you do a kind of sociology, or we do a kind of sociology, which is not really open to this main transformative power which we are experiencing. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>